Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. I got to apologize right off the bat. We got our time wrong. Uh, I didn't, it's all my fault. I didn't tell my assistant and the people who sets up or the person who sets up these live streams. I, I forgot to tell them that Arizona didn't, doesn't do daylight savings time. So they set this up for East Coast time, uh, which is now uh, an hour later than it was last Sunday. So uh, I, I'd wait an extra hour, but this weekend we had our mastermind event. It's the mastermind group that I never talk about. <laughs> it's the one I have with Ken McElroy and Jason Hartman, and it's called The Collective, which is kind of a hat tip to Ayn Rand because the group that she had back in the 1960s, I believe, was called The Collective, just kind of give the middle finger to the central planners or the collectivists. And so uh, that's what we named the mastermind group. But we were out here Friday. Uh, we were at Kenny's office with the people who were interested in real estate investing. Saturday, we had speakers. We took everyone to the racetrack. Last night, we had this huge fashion show. This morning, we had speakers. And then we just got done having kind of a luncheon type of uh, indoor-outdoor dinner at Robert Kiyosaki's house with the members. And the bottom line is it was a fantastic weekend. Absolutely awesome. But I am just beat down tired. So I would have waited until the scheduled time at 6 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and dive right in. Hopefully the people can watch it afterwards. Probably going to go maybe 30, 40 minutes here. So I can take a little bit of break and, and get some sleep. I want to uh, start off by reminding everyone that tomorrow is the first day of the Rebel Capitalist RV Tour. That is right. I have rented an RV, and we're going to make our way to Houston and then back to San Antonio. So, if it, And it's just a free meetup. We're going to have burgers and beers, and each night we're at a different campground and, with the RV, and we're just going to do a barbecue for whoever wants to show up and talk about freedom, liberty, macroeconomics and all this stuff that we talk about on this channel. You want to talk about repo, you want to talk about uh, mandates, <laughs> we'll call it. You want to talk about what's happening in China with Evergrande, with the Fed, inflation, deflation, the dollar, cryptocurrency, central bank digital currency, gold, real estate, you name it. Come out and we can all have some fun as a, a, a community of rebel capitalists. And it's going to be from six to nine each evening. Each night, it's a different location. Uh, I don't know if I said it, but again, the URL is georgegammon.com forward slash events. You can see the schedule. Tomorrow night, we're in Tucson. Tuesday night, El Paso. Wednesday night, Dallas. Thursday night, Houston. And then Sunday night, we, we take a couple nights off because I've got to speak at Mark Moss's event next weekend. But then the last night is Sunday, and that's going to be San Antonio. So check that out at georgegammon.com forward slash events. There's the the uh, schedule to six to nine, but it shows you which campground we're going to be at in each location. So if you want to show up and say hi and get a beer and a, a burger and talk about freedom, liberty, and free market capitalism, we hope to see you there. All right, let's dive into your questions for this evening. Rigo. George, my sources tell me <laughs> that Biden is freaking out <laughs> while meeting the Pope. Is it further proof the supply chain issues may be showing? Oh, okay. All right. So that was kind of a, a, a joke. Good one, Rigo. <laughs> George, have you by chance heard Richard Hacklett? He wrote a paper to the Queen titled Seeds of Western Planting. Back in 1583, I have not, Wayne. I'll have to, if I get some time, I'll try to look into that. Have you been following what's going on with GameStop and what's your take? What's called idiosyncratic risk and what about to cause mass defaults in, in January? Um, I don't know exactly what you're referring to, Abel, other than the fact that I've watched the meme stocks not my style. Uh, I don't have any interest. I couldn't have less of an interest in participating in that stock one way or the other. 
I just like to stick it to that kind of, you guys know, the 1080-10 type of portfolio. I What interests me more about what's happening with GameStop is why. It's not just an opportunity. I don't think it's, it's not just a short squeeze. It's not just because of stimmy checks, although I think that has a lot to do with it. I believe the root cause of, let's just call it this speculation that involves quite a bit of hysteria and a mania. And although there may be people who are you know, pros and rational investors doing it, I think a lot of people, the overwhelming majority of the people are doing this just because they, it's a pure gamble. They just want to get rich. It's a YOLO thing selling calls. There's a few people that may want to stick it to the man or the hedge funds, but I don't think they're really understanding how the back end there works. But regardless, what I think is most interesting is the psychology behind why there's such a large percentage of people that are taking that route. And I think it's because the Fed has kept interest rates so low for so long. They have created what I believe are negative real rates for a long, long time. Even if they say there's positive rates, that's using the CPI. I think the CPI understates the actual number. Therefore, inflation, negative real rates uh, have been with us for a lot longer than we would first assume just by looking at a chart. And we know we had them to a significant degree in the 1940s when we pegged the curve. We had financial repression, uh, which is just intentionally creating an environment where there are negative real yields or negative real interest rates. That's interest rates when you adjust for inflation. So moving, you know, since we've been in that world for so long, I think people subconsciously know that they can't keep cash. You got to do something with it. And it's it's become such a mainstream ethos or mindset. It's now become the smart thing to do, quote unquote. Well, you've got to invest your money. You just invest it into a 401k, a 40-60 stock bond split. That's what smart people do. Really? Because back in the late 1800s, you could have gotten a 7% real rate of return in a checking account, a checking account. You might have to go so far as to have a savings account. Maybe it was a time deposit instead of a demand deposit, but you would have got a 4% nominal rate uh, yield, excuse me. And you would have, and there's about 3% deflation. So 7% real yield on a bank account with, and that is as risk-free as you can get, other than maybe a treasury at the time, debatable, depending on the balance sheet that the bank you had. So this is this sets up an environment where you're not going to have people chasing whatever the, the Doge coin was back in the late 1800s. And obviously there wasn't cryptocurrency back then, but there was something that would have been, taken the place of that kind of wild speculation. So now people can't do that. Therefore, they're forced to go out the risk curve. This is how I always the phrase I always use. They're forced to become, quote unquote, investors. They're forced to become speculators. And at a certain point, if negative, negative reals get too extreme, they're forced to become gamblers. Because that's the only thing. They have to have this YOLO attitude to buy call options because that's the only thing that's going to just maintain their purchasing power even if it works let alone increase their purchasing power and if they just leave that money in the bank or maybe now you could argue even if you leave it in the stock market sure it's at all-time highs but has the market gone up over the last six months at the same rate of inflation Maybe, maybe not. It depends on what your personal inflation rate is based on what you buy on a daily basis. So 
I think it's a great question. I'm not sure if I'm answering it the way you wanted me to, but I think that's what's most interesting about GameStop from a standpoint of human psychology and macro. And I think it gives us a lot of insight as to where we could be headed in the future, knowing that what got us here to this environment where we're in this frenzy, we're in a mania, when it's uh, a hysteria, what got us here, the policies are going to not only have to continue in the future, but I would argue they will have to get more extreme. And if they've produced this, these types of distortions and this mindset up until this point in time, I think that mindset is just going to increase and get worse. People are going to be forced to take more and more and more risk because the, the, the Fed and the central planners are going to have to double down on all these policies. When are you having Neil on your show? I, I, I'm assuming you're talking about Neil Howe. I had him on the show uh, that last week, I believe. So check that out. That's on the uh, that's on the uh, George Gammon channel. Could Tether's commercial papers be loans, liquidity provided? To ever? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. I mean, Alexander, you're assume you're assuming that they've got commercial paper. How do we even know that they have commercial paper of any kind? Just because they say they do? <laughs> Come on. They've never been audited. And they won't allow people. And it, kind of that fake audit, kind of the wink, wink, nod, nod. But not a, a proper, legit audit from a, a, a big five company or something like that. A full audit of the books. You don't know what's going on there. So... I, I, who was it that was arguing and, and talking about this? I think they had a very good point. Oh, that's right. My buddy Eric Townsend was talking to Mike Green about this on last weekend's or last week's episode of Macro Voices, which I can't recommend enough. And he asked Mike, he said, Mike, why don't we come up with our own? I mean, we're sitting here kind of talking about the downside of Tether. Why don't you? Do your own stable coin because it's something that a proper stable stable coin done well, where you were actually willing to allow an auditor to audit the books, so people actually knew that uh, if you're if you got one dollar of X Y Z stable coin, that there you could actually redeem it for that dollar of stable coin. That there's a one to one backing, and he said because the only way to do that with any amount of certainty would be if you buy T bills which makes a lot of sense uh, because you know, short-term T-bills and you have very little market risk because you're only holding on to them for let's say a month or three months. And there's a strong probability that not everyone redeems their tethers for dollars within that three months. He said, the problem with that is interest rates are so low on the T-bills. That's really your profit. And it, it's just not worth the juice isn't worth the squeeze because the interest is so low. When you look at your, your overhead and I, I have no idea how much overhead would be required to run a stable coin, but I, I would assume Mike green does. And if you look at your overhead and amount you can make just on that, that yield that you're getting off those T bills, it, it's, it's, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's not worth your time. And he said that, I think that's another reason why he, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he is under the view that there, there could be some risk that the market just isn't picking up on with these uh, stable coins because they're most likely not going into treasuries. They're, they're most likely going into riskier assets to get a higher yield in order to make money. But if they're doing that, those assets that are backing up the tethers have a greater probability of volatility to the downside and them not having a one-to-one -one backing and then you kind of have a run on the bank and then the whole thing kind of implodes and if that's what's adding a lot of liquidity to the other cryptos and that could bring down their price
Which RV will you be in? I don't know. Honestly, I, I, I'm seeing if it's up on my on my browser here. I, you know, I just rented it off of this website. It's really cool. It's like a you know that website where you can rent cars for it's like a crowdsourcing or you can rent it directly peer to peer. It's like uh, Turo, I think it is T U R O. I don't know if any of you guys have used that. I've never used it, but I've just kind of browsed on the website to see what kind of cars you could get. And so you're basically renting a car just from another private party. It's the this website that I found. I think it's like RV Share or something like that. You do the exact same thing with an RV. So someone has got an RV, they're not using it. You put it on RV Share. I pay you, I don't know what I'm paying a night, like I don't know. It was like 150 bucks a night or something like that. And then you rent it for a week and you pay your insurance and there's a bit of a fee to RV share. And I think for the week I'm paying like, I, I forgot, maybe $1,500 or, or something, was something like that when you include the fees and stuff. And uh, so, so that's how I'm getting it. it. I wanted to go over that because it is a neat way to, cash flow your your plan b i've talked about this a few times on this channel but i don't think i've talked about that that i don't think i've talked about it recently this is the idea where at the very least what you can do as an american to have a plan b is just have an rv in your driveway we think back to 2020 and the riots and the looting and the unrest you think about what caused that are we gonna have more of that in the future or less I think the probabilities will probably have more, especially if the Fed keeps doing what they're doing, like we were saying earlier, and that exacerbates the wealth gap. We have this increased inflation, but we see inflation in housing, food, and energy, which historically has been the reason for people going out to the streets with the pitchforks and torches. So knowing that there's a, increasing probability of us seeing more of 2020, maybe even more extreme versions of what we saw in 2020. I don't see any downside by having an RV. Not everyone can get a second passport. Not everyone can have a bank account overseas. I get it. And not everyone can move because you might have a job that, that requires you to be in a certain location where you just don't want to be. But to get like a... a, a I mean, you can get like an old canned ham that's been like remodeled for like 10 grand, or at least you used to probably double that now. But you can get a, a good RV that will at least get you up into the hills away. Let's say you live in the city or you live in the suburbs, which is probably more realistic. You just park it in your driveway. You got your good diesel truck right there. I suggest a Ford 95 to 2002 when they had the 7.3 diesel. Those are the best. Well, that or a, a Cummins around the same year. If you can get a 12 valve, especially a 12 valve, if you get a 12 valve or a 24 valve Cummins, that that's as good of a motor. But the the truck around the motor is utter garbage. It's complete garbage. That's why I like the Fords a little bit better. The seven threes, comparable motor. You're gonna have the Ford. You're gonna have the the Power Stroke guys, and you're gonna have the the the, uh, the Cummins guys. And you know that's like Ford Chevy. They're they're gonna fight all day long. But the Dodge guys have to admit that that truck that was built around that motor was just complete junk. And the the truck that was built around the Power Stroke by Ford was a, a lot better. A lot better. Nicer to drive. Nicer quality. Just didn't rattle as much. The, the dash always cracks on the Dodges. They're just, they're terrible. So, but I, I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent there but if you can just get a nice diesel truck like that have that rv parked in your driveway you stock it with food and you just use it to go camping use it to go fishing on the weekends use it to go out and play a golf course you've never played or disc golf or something you know get outside go to the grand canyon do whatever and then maybe you're only using it once every two or three months and then it just sits there but if it hits the fan you've got something that you can just pack your family into and just head up an hour or two into the mountains or the hills, park at a campground, and just wait. Just if, if Antifa comes into town, you can just 
pack in there and, and, and leave and come back when you want to just watch it from a distance. And you know that at least you're in a place where you're out of harm's way. That's the plan B. But what's really cool about websites like, I think it was called rvshare.com, is while you're not using the RV, you can actually cash flow it. You can rent it out for 50 bucks a night, rent it out for 100 bucks a night, whatever. And I mean, this is a really neat thing to do. It's like a little rental property that's parked in your driveway the whole time. And even better, you can use it as a plan B or a rental property. You can't just pick it up and take it up into the mountains. <laughs> so I think it's kind of a no brainer. Like if I lived in the States full time, it's one of the first things I would do. And if I just lived in like a suburb or something like that, like kind of like a normal house. So I know it's, I got off on a tangent there, but I think it was important to go over that. I think that's just kind of, uh, you know, you got your gold, you got your Bitcoin, you got your RV parked in the driveway. I think that, uh, and you got your 30, 30 year fixed rate mortgage. I think that's a good start. Will China attempt to take over the world? I think so. I think, I don't know, take over the world is, is the right way to look at it, but they, obviously they want to be the, the world's, uh, a world leader, maybe the world leader. They want to be the, the dominant uh, superpower, the dominant economic power. I think that obviously United States would like to maintain that and maybe India would like to go down that path, but China is probably heading there a lot faster. So, yeah, I think they will, uh, or they'll try, but you always have these. It's like inflation and deflation. People like to look at inflation and deflation as though one is occurring or the other is occurring. It's not what's happening. They're both occurring at the same time. They're like those tectonic plates that Jim Rickards always talks about, where you, you've got these forces that are pushing up against one another constantly so it's not that do we have inflation or deflation it's we have them both there's deflationary pressure and there's inflationary pressure always occurring simultaneously it's just what is being done to give one a little bit more power than the other you see that's how you need to look at it that's the correct way of looking at it and I think it, it's like that with political powers. A lot of people just assume that there's just the global elite and, and China is somehow included in that. And they've got the exact same agenda. I actually don't agree with that. I think that although China may go along with some of the things like the, the Davos crowd talks about, maybe the Davos crowd looks at China and says, oh, wow, that's social credit score. I like that idea. I like that. And they maybe go back and forth. But I, I don't think that their, their objectives are completely aligned. Which makes sense. Because if you go back throughout history, you always had one ruler guy that was just some sort of crazed psychopath. And some of them were very efficient. And some of them were very good at what they did as far as conquering and always being at battle and trying to take over territory, whether it was the Ottoman Empire or the Roman Empire, Alexander the Great, or, uh, you know, it goes all the way back to the Sumerian Empire and the Byzantine Empire, which was kind of the tail end of the Roman Empire and uh, the Ming Dynasty and, and all of these, uh, you know, kind of factions that are, 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 always battling back and forth. Not that they were at the same time, but you had all these territories. You know, with Rome, you had the, the groups to the south and the groups to the north coming down. And they were, and then the, the Romans were not only battling them to try to maintain their territory, but then they'd go into another battle where they'd try to take over more territory and go up into what is today the, the UK and the Scotland and whatnot. And then going down into Northern Africa or maybe extending out towards uh, today's version of India with Alexander the Great. And then with the, the Chinese, with those dynasties that were that they uh, came down 
and got closer into Rome as well, different maybe sometimes at the same time, different time. But my point is they were always kind of run by this one ruler. And so it, obviously these rulers thought they were often deities. Uh, they were, they thought they were somehow a descendant of the gods. Um, I would argue probably a lot of them sociopaths and they had this insatiable lust for power. And they would do anything to get it. So this is back when the the global population was, let's say, I don't know what it was back then, but let's just say 100 million people. Okay, so now we have 7 billion people, maybe a little more. So are, are we to assume that when we have a population that's far greater in size, that we somehow don't have any of those Genghis Khan types living today? Like, really? We don't have any of the Alexander the Great types. We don't have any of the... I wish I could remember the guy that did the Ottoman Empire because he was really a legend, too. And his name's right on the tip of my tongue, but I always forget his name. But uh, and actually, he did some really great things, too. He was actually one of the first guys that was very... Um, lenient when it came toward other religions most people don't know that but my, my point there is are, are you serious like, like you seriously don't think that we have people like that living in the world today and a lot more of them of course we do it's just they're not out there trying to take over territory with spears and shields and chariots and elephants or something like that they're out there trying to do it through other ways I think they're trying to do it by a lot of the things that maybe we've seen in 2020 and 2021. And in addition to that, they're trying to influence a lot of these global corporations, uh, to put it mildly, to where they control or have greater impact over the means of production. And they can kind of They can make sure that goods and services are allocated not only in a way they want, but to who they want. That might be more important in the future. One of the speakers that we had today at the Mastermind Group, and by the way, I told you it's the collective. I don't even know what our website is. But if any of you are interested, I never talk about it, but if any of you are interested in joining the group, we've got about 30 or 40 members now. We're maxing it out at 100. We're never, ever going to have more than 100 members. But if one of you, if any of you listening would like to apply, um, I, I don't remember the website, but it, it's like a collective mastermind group or something like that. But you'll see me and Kenny and, and Hartman on there. And you can fill out an application if you're interested. But Chris was going over kind of the exponential growth of the population. And how do you cross-reference that when you look at energy? because we do have a limited supply there. And he said, in his opinion, this is what the, the globalists and the, and the Gates types, this is, they get this correct. It's just their solution is either, well, we've got to inhabit some other world. We've got to change our consumption habits dramatically, which would reduce the standard of living, or we have to, I, mean, I hate to say it, but the the other way to solve that problem is to reduce the population. I'll let you be the judge of what you think is most probable. Instead of my position and Chris's position and most people who understand free market capitalism and most people who have a, an abundance type of approach to life instead of a scarcity type of approach is yes i get it if we have nine billion people on earth which is where we're going quickly because of the the the, uh, the exponential trend line then we we will need a lot more energy we will need a lot more food a lot more than we have now but you've got to understand that technology will increase exponentially you got to understand that with that if we have nine billion people in the world we've we're going to have more scientists 
We're going to have more business people. We're going to have more entrepreneurs. We're going to have more geniuses. We're going to have more people out there that have the ability to create things that we that we just can't imagine today that will possibly solve those problems. I mean, listen, this is not something new. You go back throughout history and the Malthusians have been here for a long, long time. These people that are always warning that there's too many people, not enough resources. And, and I get it. But what has happened time and time and time again is if you allow the free market to work, and sometimes not even really a free market, but a, a private, a system of private property rights and a certain degree of freedom. But even better, if you have a, an actual free market capitalist economy, we, we tend to solve these problems. And we're very good at that. We're very good at adaptation. So that would be my approach. It wouldn't be, obviously, it wouldn't be reduce the size of the population. It wouldn't be, okay, let's eat crickets instead of beef or something like that, uh, which I'm not sure that really moves the needle, but Klaus seems to think it will. Uh, that would not be my approach. My approach would be let's reduce regulation. Let's get the, let's shrink government. Let, not eliminate it, but let's shrink it here. And let's have, go back to true private property rights. Let's go back to being a, a country uh, of law and not of men. Let's go back to sound money. Let's go back to having constraints on the government like the Constitution. Let's go back to having constraints on the central bank, if not eliminating it, like the, uh, the Federal Reserve Act. If you do these things, and in addition to that, you start to decrease taxes, when you can, I think you're going to solve those problems. And see, that's what they forget, is that you do have more problems as the amount of people grow, but you have more people to solve those problems. And you have an ex that, that exponential growth curve doesn't just apply to the population. That exponential growth curve, I would argue, also applies to people's ability to solve problems because the knowledge is compounded. The, we don't have to figure out all these things that we had to figure out in the 1600s or 1800s prior to the Industrial Revolution because we already figured these things out. And that, that knowledge can compound. We can learn it fast. Now with the internet, you've got all these tools at your disposal. You can communicate with someone in India. Someone in India can immediately communicate with someone in Russia and, and, and so on. I think that if you just allow people to do what they do well, if you allow the free market to work, we're going to solve these problems. And that's a, obviously, uh, uh, well, maybe it's not obvious to the authoritarians and the central planners, but for the rebel capitalists, that's obviously a far better pro approach in every single way than uh, creating some sort of bizarre consumption structure that limits what you can eat or what you can choose to buy or you know, basically brings our living standard back to what it was in the late 1800s. And then obviously the, the, the completely, the option that's, that's not even on the table at all, obviously, I don't think I have to say this, but, uh, you know, reducing the, the, the population, that's uh, what a lot of the, you know, that that's such a, that's such a tough subject to discuss. For um, I don't even like thinking about that because it's so disturbing. Um, I would, uh, you know, I'm obviously not a big fan of the global elite. Not a big fan of central planners or Marxists. I'm not a big fan of Klaus or Bigglesworth or any of those people that you want to throw into that group, Benioff. But it's still very hard for me to truly believe that's the intention. Maybe I'm too naive. I just can't imagine another human being that would uh, that would have such a lack of of conscious that that would be such. Uh, it's just disgusting. It's sickening. It's just, uh, it's like trying to put yourself in the mind of a, a serial killer or something. It's just, it's just impossible to do. 
Uh, so hopefully that's not their objective. But, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of what their objective is, if we come together as a group of rebel capitalists, as people who understand history, people who understand why principles are so important, people who understand the value of critical thinking, the value of, of free speech, uh, the value of prioritizing freedom and liberty over safety, the value of individualism compared to authoritarianism, that we're, we're going to win this. So personally, I don't think it's a good use of my time to really go to that dark place to try to figure out what their end game is. I, I just know that in order to get there, they want us to go down a path, even if their intentions are good, even if their intentions are well, in order to create more resources to handle the increased population, we think socialism is a way to get there. You know, even if that's, they have good intentions, right? Um, still, we got to get off that road because we all know where that leads. So, and there's more of us than there is of them. I mean, I spent time with, uh, we have about 30 or 40 members, but they brought their spouses and some people brought their business partners and whatnot. These are very high net worth individuals. It's extremely expensive uh, to join and be a member of the collective. It, it's, it's, it's rarefied air up there. And what's inspiring is how many of these people are, they come from all different areas. You know, they're real estate investors, they're entrepreneurs, they're, uh, a lot of people have made a ton of money in crypto or, or whatever they've done. And uh, they, they're all of them, their number one priority right now is just freedom, liberty. And it's, it's really, really cool. A lot of them aren't in a position where they can talk about it like I do. But uh, they, they all want to do everything they can to play a part in pushing back and getting us back on the road to the values that this country was built on. And they want to do it for this country and they want to do it for the globe. Not, not just this country, every single country. Well, this, is a, well, this is a global problem. This is not just a problem in the United States. And these people are, are, are really willing to put a lot of resources, a lot of mental bandwidth into solving these problems. And that's really cool. That is really cool. And it, 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 you don't have to be you know, someone that's worth $50 million or $100 or, million, or like someone in, in our uh, mastermind. Listen, you can do this at any level. If you have one of these right here, you can do this. You can you can make a big, big difference. And if you guys don't follow the Rebel Capitalist channel, you should. You should. Because what I'm trying to do, in addition to everything else, is I'm trying to help people for free, for free, build, create their own content. And then you can do it whatever you want, but it, it's great if I can help people build content around the message of freedom, liberty, and free market capitalism. So whether that's starting a blog, whether that's starting a podcast, whether that's starting a YouTube channel, uh, Friday morning, and you guys can watch it, it's up on the Rebel Capitalist channel right now, for an hour and 45 minutes, I, I walked people through the back end, the analytics for the George Gammon channel. And I told people the story of how that started. And I walked them step by step how I took that channel from getting, you know, 20 views a day on the entire channel when we started back in the summer of 2019, just two years ago, to where we were six or seven months later, where instead of getting 20 or, or 70 views a day, we were getting 70,000 views a day. 70,000, right? 
And it's not because I'm anything special or anything like that. It's just because people really are thirsty for this type of content. And also, uh, I really paid attention to those backend analytics. And I tried things. And I tried different thumbnails, different editing techniques. And I took action. I think that's the biggest key. And that's one thing that's probably made me successful more than anything else is I don't like to sit there and plan stuff. I don't like to, I really don't like to have a plan often. Uh, I, I like to do, I like to get up and do it. Let's just do everything. Let everything that makes sense, let's do it. And let's do it to the best of our ability. Understanding that nine times out of 10, we're going to fail. And that's great. Because then I know what not to do. But that one time that we succeed, then I know we need to do more of that. And in my opinion, by getting up there and taking action in 10 things, it, it's going to, you're going to progress a lot further than by sitting there and planning something detail by detail by detail for the next two years, but yet never creating a piece of content or, or just maybe it's starting a business, maybe it's doing whatever. Maybe you want to run for local office or you want to uh, help out the local sheriff to increase the the level of freedom or maintain it or to fight back against the authoritarians whatever it is just whatever you're planning whatever you're thinking about doing it don't think do just be more like ricky bobby <laughs> remember what she said to him at the end of the movie ricky bobby isn't a thinker ricky bobby is a doer now I think you should maintain your critical thinking ability, but I also think that you should be more like Ricky Bobby and get out there and, and do it, make it happen. And so my point is I was walking people through that so they could learn from my mistakes and learn from the things that I might have done well, that maybe I figured out along the way so that you can create your own content, whatever you feel most comfortable doing. And maybe you only have time to do something once a month, maybe a video or uh, it doesn't matter anything you can do. Just, just start, just take action. And if, if we can, if I can help a thousand people do that and, and then I can continue to do it and then they can help some other people do it. Maybe they don't have a channel that gets a hundred thousand subscribers. So what? Maybe they just have a channel that gets 200 or 300, but yet they build their own little neat community. And you see, we all do that. And the next thing you know, we're opening up millions and millions of people's eyes to this road to serfdom that we're on right now. And by doing that, we create a movement where we're more powerful than the opposition, right? And obviously, I've never condoned violence. I know I'm kind of using fighting terminology, but I'm not saying you're, you're going out there and fighting people or anything. But what I am saying is that we, we create this movement where you, we can practice civil disobedience. And I think that's how you win, right? If you haven't heard the story of when I uh, first met Gerald Salente and who is now uh, someone I've only met him, uh, I guess once, but we spent a lot of time together, but I just, I really have a strong connection with Gerald. Uh, he and I are, are, see the world in very similar ways and i'll always be very thankful for the for that interaction that we had uh and i'll be thankful to to max kaiser because max is a great guy and uh he set up the event the bitcoin event which is where i was able to uh, meet gerald in the first place but i'll always remember that conversation i had with gerald when we were there just talking for two hours about what we can do to really uh fight back and, uh, you know, he told me about the story of the Berlin Wall coming down. And basically what happened, they didn't have any guns. You know, they, they, didn't, they didn't have anything like that. They didn't have tanks. They didn't have missiles. They didn't have a, anything like that set up. They, they just had enough people that practiced civil disobedience. And that overwhelmed all the guards. That overwhelmed the soldiers. That overwhelmed all all the guns because if you're that soldier and there's 2000 other people there, you can't shoot anybody because you know, darn well, you shoot someone and your life expectancy is about two minutes. 
So the soldiers drop their guns and the wall comes down, brick by brick, stone by stone. And I think that's how we tear down this Berlin Wall that is being built around us today. And we have the tool of the internet, and sure it can be taken away, and sure they can do this, and sure they can, you can make up a thousand excuses not to do something. But if we all start to take action in whatever way we can, uh, you know, we're going to wake up in a year or two, and and we're going to be very proud of the progress we've made. You know, one thing I do agree with Bill Gates on, and I I, I think this was his quote. He says most people overestimate what they can do in one year and they wildly underestimate what they can do in five. So you think about that. If if we had 10,000, 100,000 people out there doing what they can do to open up people's eyes in the United States and we did that for five years I think the probability of us winning this fight and getting back on the path to freedom and liberty and free market capitalism would be extraordinarily high. So that's, uh, shoot, I went off on that tangent, but I think that was worth talking about. So uh, I'm going to end it there, guys, so I can get a little rest. I've still got to do another live stream with the members. Let me do some shout outs here. I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me tonight. Sorry for the the, the weird time. We just uh, had that issue of daylight savings time. And if you guys do want to check out that, that podcast that kind of deep dive I did, if you want to start creating your own content, whether it's a podcast or a YouTube channel or blog, it's all kind of the same stuff. Uh, check that out on the Rebel Capitalist channel. And I'm going to try to do those like once every two weeks. And so if you're someone that starts right now, or maybe you've got one in the pro- in progress, you just log on w- once every couple of weeks when we put them up there and we can all just talk and help each other out uh, to where we can grow our, our, our reach and um, we can just make it happen together as a, a community of, of rebel capitalists, right? Yeah, Market Mania Canada, he was on there. I just see him right here in the chat. So good to see you back, my friend. Hopefully... Some of those tips were uh, are working out for you. And Anthony Quartz here, he started his own YouTube channel. I know that. So, guys, if, if they can do it, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Trust me. All right. So, who's in the house? We got oh, Escape the Matrix, RR, Rob, Tor, 853, Malaysia, Numismatic, Silver Fox, Tacticus, 1979, Justin Tr- <laughs> Trudeau. <laughs> I like the spelling on that. That's funny. Uh, by... Warwickham Stalker NZ, J Crypto Gold Silver, PBG Leroy Kincaid, Dylan Appenfelt. Who else do we got here? Drifter, Zach Thrash R, Andrew McDonald. <laughs> I can't say that one, but good, good name there, buddy. The, the, the Ed. Well, let's call him Ed. Good one, my friend. Dickie Dunn, Theodis Lund, Jenny, Joe G's Craft Cannabis Guides. And one more shout out I want to do. And I had the opportunity to meet this gentleman. He came out to the racetrack with us and, and I hung out with him last night at our fashion show. One of the nicest dudes I have ever met in my life. His name is Michael Waltrip. And he is a NASCAR, was a NASCAR driver. Now he does announcing for Fox. Um, try to support that guy in any way you can on social media. Follow him on, you know, he does the announcing. If you're a NASCAR fan, uh, definitely check him out. One of the coolest, nicest, most genuine guys I have ever had the opportunity to meet. Uh, Michael, can't wait to hang out again, buddy. That was That was a real special experience that I'll remember for a long, long time. All right, guys, we'll see you out there on the road on the RV tour at georgegammon.com forward slash events, and we'll see you on the next video.